Hello and welcome to Skydive Today's Last Week in AI podcast, where you can hear AI researchers chat about what's going on with AI. As usual, in this episode, we'll provide summaries and discussion of last week's most interesting AI news. You can also check out our Last Week in AI newsletter at lastweekend.ai for articles we both did and did not cover in this episode. I am one of your hosts, Dr. Sharon Joe. And I am your other host, aspiring doctor, Andre Karankov. <laughs> very, very close to me. Very close. So close. Just a few months, hopefully. Um, before we dive in, uh, as I often like to do, let's do a status check on any new reviews we got. Uh, excitingly, we are now at 20 ratings on Apple Podcasts, and that led us to have a 5.0 rating. So. Apparently, we are really great, uh, is what it seems like. <laughs> we still know that despite the seemingly perfect score, we still need to strive for, for perfection. We need to strive. We have to continue striving. We are far from perfect, that's for sure. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's a fun new review from someone that I think you know, you mentioned, uh, that is very uh, positive. So thank you for that. And let's go ahead and let me tell you what we're going to be covering. So, our applications Thank and you, business. Tim. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Tim, you're awesome. It's great to see uh, mine. Okay. Sorry. Keep going. <laughs> all righty. So, for applications and business, uh, we got some stories with autonomous cargo ship and the state of investing uh, in AI. Then in research and advancements, we'll be talking about a new generalist AI from DeepMind and a new DALI to a competitor from Google. And then in society and ethics, we'll talk about AI for checking for guns and AI for helping to curb drownings. And we'll finish up with some fun uh, things like a novelist and AI co-writing your next cringe read. Uh, so let's go ahead and dive in. In applications and business, our first article is Autonomous Cargo Ship Completes 500-Mile Voyage, Avoiding Hundreds of Collisions. So this is the first autonomous uh, commercial cargo ship that actually successfully completed an almost 500-mile voyage completely autonomously in the waters of Tokyo Bay. Um, and actually traveled without human intervention for 99% of the trip. Uh, it, the vessel itself uh, took on 750 gross tons and was powered by a company called Orca AI, um, whose software helped the ship avoid a lot of the targets autonomously. Uh, this you know, company was founded in 2018 by two naval technology experts um, and is headquartered in Israel. And they're seeking to basically... Uh, enable these autonomous cargo ships um, to to be able to ship, you know, uh, sh a lot of things autonomously without people. And this is very, very important to um, the Japanese government, actually, because as they've seen, they use they use a ton of uh, boats all the time since they're an island. Um, and, but with COVID, uh, it's really, really made it hard um, to to make some of these voyages. So to do it without much human intervention is absolutely huge and astonishing. Uh, I was very surprised, but also skeptical of the 99% of the trip because a lot of you know sea voyages, most of the time you're not doing much. Um, so I, I, I would be, I, I'd be curious where the 99% was really coming from. But all in all, I, I do think it um, is great that this is that this is uh, being pushed on. Yeah, exactly. It's. Um... Little interesting to note to what extent AI helped here. It, the article does note that uh, the software was able to identify targets in a complex Japanese shoreline environment. So maybe it wasn't that simple. But then again, maybe a lot of it is just sort of what you have in autopilot on planes, which yep. uh, is not deep learning or neural nets or any of this sort of business. Yes. Uh, but still, you know, um, cargo ships are a huge deal. In general, my understanding is it, it powers really most of the world's economy, you know, goods going across international waters uh, or even between different parts of the same country. There's a ridiculous amount of traffic of cargo ships. 
so this is a you know 750 ton vessel and there's a lot of these kinds of things so yeah i would imagine that this is something that will be pretty impactful uh, if only to help ensure, you know, safe driving so you won't have a Suez Canal situation <laughs> again. Uh, right. We definitely don't want that that situation again. Um, and I, I think it also is very, very uh, important to highlight that this is really useful for countries like Japan, uh, who, you know, the majority of their international trade does rely on shipping. And so it's very important for them to pursue these technological solutions to make shipping safer and potentially even faster. Um, I, di I did watch a, vu a video by Orca AI. You know, they are, uh, they say they're using computer vision to kind of identify ships, um, be able to predict um, and track like what, you know, direction and speed they're going at. So I, I do think, you know, there is some element of that. Of course, it's not nearly as dense as self-driving um, and there's a lot more you could you know, navigate direction wise, not just in a single lane um, on the open sea. And so uh, it almost is a, a very good place to start uh, delivering value, even if it's not the most advanced stuff to begin with. Yeah, I do think there's a comparison to be made to autonomous driving, where most likely it's not sort of a, a fully learned system. There's a perception component and a control component, and putting these together, it can actually work pretty well. So uh, maybe not the most uh, sexy of stories, but I think a pretty big deal for business and you know, all the impact. And on to our second story we have from Axios, investors pull back on artificial intelligence. Uh, so this focuses on a new analysis from CB Insights which uh, kind of a big uh, takeaway is that funding for AI-focused health startups fell 32% in Q1 of 2022, and funding for all AI startups fell by 12% uh, last quarter to $15.1 billion, down from $17.1 billion in Q4 of 2021. Uh, health AI accounts for 17% of that. So it's a larger subsector. And there's some other interesting uh, details here. You know, so there's over 15 billion in global funding. Like we said, uh, there are 14 new unicorns born in Q1 2022, as we've mentioned some of them in this, uh, in this podcast. So pretty, pretty solid analysis, even if uh, we can only get access to a bit of it without paying a ton of money. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little little small jab right there. Uh, so uh, this basically means, you know, COVID funding has cooled a tiny bit. I, I would say it's still, you know, quite hot, quite frankly. Um, it, this is health AI very much uh, falling uh, much in terms of the, um, the proportion here, but it is still, you know, still higher than at the end of 2020. And it, it pr looks pretty on par as, you know, the beginning of 2021. Uh, so I, I don't think it's a, you know, huge, massive, um, uh, crazy dip. Um, it is it is a dip from last year, last year's boon. Um, but there there might be, you know, as people have been talking about recession stuff, there might be that coming. And so we might be starting to to see the decline um, uh, decline here. Yeah, and if you look at uh, some of these charts for exits and also unicorns, it does look like there's been a consistent trend since last year, since Q1 2021, where every subsequent quarter, just about uh, there was a decline or almost a decline. So for some reason, there was a really large peak last year, and it looks like it's starting to calm down which definitely, I would imagine, is impacted by the overall economy, uh, as uh, maybe many of our listeners in the U.S. have been seeing uh, the economy is not doing great, so it would be expected for this to affect uh, AI businesses as well. Absolutely. This definitely is not going to just impact health, though health very much did take the biggest hit here. And on to our lightning round. The first article is ClearBot Neo autonomously clears plastic from harbors. 
this is Open Ocean Engineering's Clearbot Neo. Um, it's a robotic boat that will autonomously navigate harbors, canals, and rivers to collect trash that otherwise would wash into the ocean. Another autonomous boat. Another autonomous boat and uh, pretty useful application, around 14 million tons of plastics end up in the ocean. And uh, 95% of that comes from 10 major rivers. So hopefully this can help address that. And the next article is you can practice for a job interview with Google AI. So instead of you know practicing with friends or looking at generic guides or even leak code, um, Google is hoping that uh, their algorithms can actually prep you for a job interview. Uh, and you know Google has launched an interview warm-up tool that uses AI to help you prep for interviews across actually a variety of roles. Something I might benefit from as I graduate <laughs> and go for my job search. Next up, uh, two more stories. First up, we have Uber Eats dabbles with delivering food via robots. So uh, Uber Eats is starting to use autonomous food delivery in the Los Angeles area. It is collaborating with two companies, uh, Motional and Serve Robotics. And the first one being an autonomous vehicle company and the second one being an autonomous sidewalk delivery company. Uh, Seems pretty exciting. I assume this will take a long time to actually lead to anything beyond these experiments. Well, I've seen some sidewalk robots in Mountain View. Yeah, we'll we'll see how far um, this gets. <laughs> but it is exciting and does match what Uber has looked at before. I, I was actually um, curious whether they would go into this space. Yeah, I do like this concept, so it would be fun. Yeah, they've done self-driving, they've done, you know, obviously food delivery, so why not both? <laughs> There's a lot of these sidewalk delivery companies. There are so, so many. <laughs> yeah. And last up, we have Ford-backed robotaxi startup Argo AI is ditching its human safety drivers in Miami and Austin. So robotaxi startup Argo AI said just this past week that it has begun operating its autonomous test vehicles without human safety drivers in those two cities, which is a major milestone for the Ford and Volkswagen-backed company. For now, uh, these driverless vehicles won't be carrying paying customers. Presumably, they'll be uh, still in testing mode. But uh, yeah, exciting. Yet another, we've just covered a story last week, I think, of uh, this happening in China. And Waymo is doing this now. So it seems like we are actually seeing some progress in autonomous driving. Maybe self-driving is actually here. So... Uh, that's exciting. And as a reminder, Lyft actually owns a 2.5% equity stake in Argo AI. So, you know, it's connected with, with Lyft there. All righty. And on to research and advancements. With our first story being DeepMind's new AI can perform over 600 tasks from playing games to controlling robots. So this covers a brand new paper from DeepMind called A Generalist Agent. And this covers a new AI system called Gato, Gato, I'm not sure, uh, which Gato. is Gato, which is uh, deemed a general purpose system. Uh, so unlike most previous AI systems uh, that are generally focused on one task, like object classification, or even GPT-3 is focused on only language type tasks, although it can generalize to some extent, this system, uh, Gato, can do a bigger variety of tasks. It can play video games like Atari. It can uh, classify images, generate captions for images, control a robot, uh, do a chatbot type system, question answering, 600 plus tasks. And what's different from anything done before is that all of this is done with a single model that is a single set of parameters. There's no sort of like subnetworks or anything like that. And it's done with the same types of inputs and outputs. So there's no need to sort of 
train uh, different components and combine them. It's all trained at the same time with the same representations and so on, which led to a lot of excitement and discussion among people in the AI sphere as to whether this is a big step towards general AI, you know, even maybe um, artificial general AI, AGI, as is uh, popularly referred to, or whether this is maybe cool, but not necessarily that indicative of major progress. And that's kind of really up to interpretation, I would say. Uh, so DeepMind has been coming out with uh, a, you know, a lot of uh, very interesting papers, and this just follows the trend of their naming, but now it's in Spanish, gato meaning cat. Uh, before, they also had chinchilla, flamingo, and the like. Uh, and... You know, I, I really think that um, I, I know there's a lot of there's a lot of criticism in the AI community. Oh, this is not like that much better. You know, um, one actually very big criticism is that while it's learning all of these tasks, the more tasks it learns, it actually gets worse at the other ones. And so, uh, if you think about how a person learns, you know, ideally as you pick up new tasks, you can actually borrow some skills across them and get better, right, at other things, um, instead of getting worse at former things. Um, of, of course, there's also the case of, hey, I can only do so many things, uh, I'll forget the other ones. Um, and so um, that's been a criticism. Another criticism is that this isn't actually that interesting. We've been seeing this coming. Uh, I still think this is a this is a great piece of work, um, especially for those who are, you know, maybe a little more adjacent to the AI community. This is, I think, a pretty important milestone um, of where we've gotten, even if the last few uh, breakthroughs recently have been pointing to getting here, you know. Um, and I think, you know, if you ask someone even just five years ago whether we'd get here, I, I think people would feel doubtful. Um, and so this is, um, I think, a, a pretty big deal um, and just points to how fast things are moving along, especially when AR researchers are not even that super impressed with it so yeah i think it has been definitely a bit of a mixed reaction but on the whole i think it's been very positive uh and i would say it's definitely a valuable piece of work regardless of how much of a big deal it is in terms of saying oh wow we're getting closer to agi you know it is a more general ai than anything we've seen in terms of being able to do this variety of tasks of dealing with language, images, control of robotics, um, uh, video games. It's, we haven't seen all of those different types of tasks handled in a single architecture uh, with, a, with a single training uh, mechanism as well. And it does have other limitations. So it, for instance, for robotics and video games, it uses purely supervised learning. So usually you do reinforcement learning, trial and error, but here you have to have collected data to learn from, which is a bit atypical. And um, yeah, it actually turns out that for the most part, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, but perhaps disappointingly, it pretty much never um, does better or rarely does better on most of these tasks uh, that it can do. That being said, I I mean, it's very, very impressive how small the system is. It's only 1.2 billion parameters. And as a reminder, GBT3 is several orders of magnitude larger than that. I think three orders of magnitude larger than that, 170 billion parameters. So uh, it is significantly smaller than what people are using now. Um, and it, it can already do, it can fit so many different tasks. And so I think what's pretty cool is that if we do scale this up, it should be able to do much better at these tasks uh, based on our scaling laws these days. Um, and of course, what Andre is suggesting, we should also be thinking about, oh, how else can we incorporate reinforcement learning into this? Because a lot of these tasks do benefit from, uh, from, that, from that scheme. Exactly. And um, yeah, I think actually the, the watch performance isn't a bad thing. I think this paper is really valuable as an empirical study and what you can expect. And right now it seems like the learning all these tasks jointly doesn't benefit, right? You don't become better at other things, uh, but it's really interesting. There is a scaling laws analysis that shows that as you increase the model size, it gets better pretty much uniformly. 
So yeah, I think it's it's really exciting work, really interesting, and I am certain we'll see more of this sort of thing happening, you know, for the rest of this year and pretty much going forward. Yep, probably gonna happen next week. It's fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> might open AI is not far behind, I'm sure. O- open AI is like we we already have this too. Darn, you released it before us. Speaking of which, Google had the same feeling, I believe, which is our next article. Google claims its text to image AI delivers quote unprecedented photorealism. Uh, so this is Google's announcement of Imagine or Imagen. Uh, which is very similar to OpenAI's Dolly 2 that goes from uh, text to an image. So you can input any kind of text and it will uh, you know, produce and draw some kind of image. Uh, and Google very much spent uh, some time comparing Imogen to other text image models, including that of Dolly 2 by OpenAI, as well as uh, VQGAN and Clip, which was uh, used by people previously. Uh, and they created uh, specifically a benchmark called Draw Bench, um, and that was a list of 200 text prompts, and that was entered into each of these models, and then human raters were asked to assess um, these images. Uh, and the human raters very much preferred Imagine over the other models, um, both in sample quality and also image text alignment. That is, uh, the text put in was actually what was drawn out by the model. And that was definitely something that I noticed with OpenAI's model that, you know, sometimes it wasn't really, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't exactly what I, I, I asked for. So I would say, you know, a gold retriever riding in a hot air balloon would uh, would actually produce this one of my favorites. Actually, I made it my phone background because I loved it so much, which was it actually just gave a giant golden retriever hot air balloon like the balloon itself was like <laughs> dog. Um, and i was like no uh, I, I see what you're doing here but no um and a bunch of those you know it just it wouldn't produce the other thing so um i think uh and it was funny because someone commented on that on twitter that you know hey you don't know that there's no golden retriever inside of that hot air balloon <laughs> i was like you know what okay okay um but google's model here um uh, they claim does a much better job of that, and they have a site that shows uh, some of their models' results. Of course, it uh, they don't have uh, an open API for people to work with, even even with limited access, they don't have that either. Uh, and uh, that's because they do touch on how um, dangerous uh, it could be, because they did just uh, train this model on uh, data sets that may not have been fully cleaned up and may have. Um, inappropriate content. Uh, again, that's that's always kind of a bit of a cop out thing, but you know, you know, uh, it's. I mean, it's to prevent also uses of deep fakes and the like. So yeah, it's it's. I think yeah, it's it's kind of lame, but then again, with these gigantic models, I think we will probably stop being surprised that they don't get released. But otherwise, yeah, this is really really cool and pretty interesting in that. Actually, the approach is simpler than DALI 2. It's very straightforward. Like, if you look at the diagram, it's like <laughs> there's very little going on and it's very simple, but, um, you know, it, it just works and it works really well. I think I just started to get over how mind blowing DALI 2 is, and now this comes out and blows my mind again. Uh, and I also do really like this draw bench benchmark. I think it's uh, it's focused on looking at things like composi- compositionality, compositionality uh, number counting, and the things that people have actually seen in that things like Dali 2 are maybe weak on rather than just like super funny, weird images that are kind of arbitrary. So I do think that uh, starting to do this more principled form of benchmarking is a good idea for these sorts of things. And looking forward to Meta releasing its giant uh, image. Oh, <laughs> um, no, no pressure though, because I, I don't know how many of these we really do need. I think we'll be watching on the horizon whether China does actually release something like this, which I, which I, I would guess they would. Um, and, and again, this is the trend towards large language models actually. So despite the fact that it's generating images, uh, the paper does note that actually, if you just, uh, you know, improve the language model, it'll do even better. It's less about scaling up. It's less about scaling up the image and doing the super resolution part. It's more about the language model. So 
it's about getting that language, understanding that language, understanding those language embeddings, um, and getting getting that really good and making your language model probably much larger. That is what helps. So. You know, the trend is still, the conclusion is still large language models work um, and make larger. It is a little unintuitive. I believe in DALI 2, they used Clip, which is trained both on images and text. Here, they use a language model that just has seen text as a sort of input uh, embedding representation, and it still works really well. So, um I guess it's good to know. Just keep it simple. <laughs> Just keep it very simple. Um, yeah. And on to our lightning round. And our first article is Simultaneous Emulation of Neuronal and Synaptic Properties Promotes the Development of Brain-Like Artificial Intelligence. So researchers have reported a nano-sized neuromorphic memory device that emulates neurons and synapses simultaneously in a unicell which is another step towards completing the goal of neuromorphic computing designed to rigorously mimic the human brain with semiconductor devices. This is really interesting to me because I'm curious if we actually can mimic the brain in some way, can we actually get gains um, given, given what our brains can learn um, and, and how much our brains can capture, which you know may not be actually as, as big as some of these giant neural networks today. Yeah, and I believe we discussed something related a week or two ago. So if you're curious, you can look back for that. And the next article is study face-to-face -face screening combined with machine learning model performs best at suicide risk prediction. Uh, so this is a, a study published in JAMA Network Open, and it shows that a combination of in-person screenings and some machine learning worked better than either method alone when it came to predicting suicide attempts and suicidal ideation in adults, um, suggesting that you know perhaps just one or the other is too much bias, and having both really helps inform the situation. Uh, again, this is still you know research uh, is not necessarily definitive, uh, but it's interesting to see uh, humans and 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 machine learning here uh, collaborate. Exactly. And our other story is here. We got Google's universal pre-training framework unifies language learning paradigms. So Google has released yet another language model, but this one is relatively small at 20 billion parameters. And despite that, it has surpassed GPT-3 on the most popular kind of super blue benchmark. And also uh, out does another language model and that's because they, Google has figured out a way to train these kinds of networks in a, in a way that works better, essentially. And our last story is robotic surgery is safer and improves patient recovery time. So robot-assisted surgery used to perform bladder cancer removal and reconstruction enables patients to recover far more quickly and spend 20% less time in hospitals, according to a clinical trial. And again, I think we discussed something related to this pretty recently, a uh, big area of robotic surgery that I'm pretty excited about. And on to our favorite section, the ad, which is <laughs> that we are using the wonderful Zencaster right now um, to deliver this wonderful podcast to you. And it has saved our butts, as we have told you before, because sometimes you just, you know, you stop the recording, something happens, your internet cuts out, and Zencaster actually saves the day and is recording it locally and actually has it all. And even if your interview is super important and your interviewer, uh, interviewee leaves, you still have all the recordings and can recover everything. So never losing your interviews. Great sound obviously because it's doing it locally it doesn't require you know all that um yeah, the connection up there in the cloud and uh the video is fantastic when you need it as well so again if you do want a discount um 30 off your first three months of a pro account you can go to zen.ai slash last week in ai um for the discount we can give you um, but of course you can also try it for free um initially uh and uh, it's it's a great tool yeah, we actually started this podcast like a week before the major COVID uh, restrictions got in place in 2020, and we had to figure out a remote solution right away, and 
we just picked Zencaster and have stuck with it ever since. So we like it and we don't mind promoting it. Moving on to our society and ethics stories. First up, we have AI may be searching you for guns the next time you go out in public. So this is about a product of Evolve technology, which sells an AI-based system for flagging weapons. And more specifically, the way it works is it uses active sensing, a light emission technique that underpins radar and LiDAR to create images and then applies AI to look for guns uh, and things like that based on training from data. So it seems kind of like uh, the things you have in airports of um, you know, those body scanners, but more compact and you just really walk through them. And it seems like they've really been growing. So this article covers how uh, sport franchises like the T Tennessee Titans and the Carolina, Carolina Panthers use it. Uh, the Super Bowl at SoFi Stadium deployed it. Schools are using it. Municipal hospitals are using it. Uh, so it's really growing. And, uh, and, you know, it seems like people do like it. There are some quotes here. But, of course, there's also some concerns uh, on this kind of technology. Yeah, they specifically state that uh, actually it's less obtrusive um, and more effective in, in some cases to using metal detectors. Uh, so they're hoping to make events safer and, you know, more pleasant to attend. Uh, of course, that also means, you know, someone who's bringing in a weapon has less of a deterrent potentially. But, you know, like those metal detectors don't feel like they're actually doing much. I'm not actually sure how much they, they do or how much they're just there to you know, to be a deterrent. Um. Yeah, it's it's also uh, noted that um, it does help security guards in that they don't wear out as much. Like if you're constantly checking, you know, pockets and things like that, uh, you can sort of start zoning out and you know, just get tired out, which is also true with uh, airport inspectors where you also have AI type systems being deployed. So arguably, it could help actually improve uh, the human uh, kind of capacity to be careful and examine things. Um, so personally, it seems like a good idea to me, just as a replacement to metal detectors. It'll make it quicker to get in and out uh, of events. And given all the news we've seen in the US uh, and the number of guns people buy in the US, uh, it does seem like something that is beneficial to me. Yes, alas, that is the reality there. Um, uh, yeah, that is the reality there. So that's why it's used for um, all these performan uh, per performance areas. So like stadiums, performing arts, complexes, etc. Uh, and, you know, the, the company has raised uh, a lot of money, um, at least uh, 400 million and actually went public last year um, and had a lot of backers, including Jeb Bush, Bill Gates, Peyton Manning. So actually a decent amount of representation there um, across party lines, I guess. Uh, and uh, overall, they said they flagged 15,000 guns, at least um, uh, in the first quarter of 2022. Uh, these numbers weren't, you know, specifically vetted, but that, that is that is a claim which uh, would be quite quite impressive indeed, and I know that you know, you know the the state of you know sh shootings and and the like ha hasn't been looking too bright. Um, so seeing you know if there's some security or some some things around that that would be very helpful and help make some of these spaces public spaces uh, safer. Yeah, I think the main concern actually probably is the transparency aspect. So the article also notes that IPVM, a security industry trade publication, uh, did a sort of review and uh, concluded that there are some fundamental technological uh, limitations in this kind of things. And um, they didn't have much data actually to do a full analysis. So as we've seen in the past, there's really no mechanism to do any sort of auditing on accuracy or performance. 
And that means that people might come up with novel ways to trick the AI, like by just putting tape over guns or, you know, doing something that is not seen in the data as an adversarial example. So that is a concern. And I think it would be great if, again, there's some laws around transparency and auditing for these kinds of uh, critical security systems. And on to our next article, Israeli firm hopes AI can curb drownings. Uh, So a company called SiteBit uh, in Israel is using information collected from cameras, surveillance cameras, uh, to determine who's in the water, an adult uh, or child, um, and whether they are moving or they are limp, uh, and uh, also understanding the current's movement at a certain location. And if they think that someone is drowning, you know, if there's a threat, they'll send an alert to a tablet um, that's held by a lifeguard with urgent instructions to act. Um, and this is uh, in particular um, being used for more than a year in Ashdod, which is a city in Israel's Mediterranean coast, um, that chose to deploy this technology um, in areas that are you know, at a distance from the nearest lifeguard so that there are essentially additional, quote, eyes um, to help where there aren't actually lifeguards are always watching. Uh, And they're hoping that they can save lives in this way because uh, this country does see dozens of deaths um, from drowning every single year. Uh, And according to official figures last year, uh, 29 people died during Israel's March to October beach season alone. Uh, 22 of them were in the Mediterranean um, and 21 were in areas with no lifeguard services. So this is really stationing these things where there is no lifeguard and also here near the Mediterranean where um, a lot of those were happening. Yeah, this is uh, pretty cool and very intuitive, right? It's it, it seems very difficult for a lifeguard to keep sight and kind of careful watch over, you know, wide landscape, especially for things that are more far out. And it makes a lot of sense that AI could actually help with that. So um, I could see this becoming commonplace and you know the u.s has a lot of beaches and coasts um, the east and west coasts so um i could see you know this company expanding to here so exciting to see uh this this development and uh not too surprising that it's coming out of israel israel does have a pretty active uh startup scene and a lot of ai companies uh being born there so that's pretty cool yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see where this goes. I also um, would be worried from the startup standpoint, you know, it's it's hard to justify, you know, it's hard to, you know, what if there are a lot of false positives is one, and then the other is, is that many drownings enough to like catch all of them? And, you know, how distributed are they? So how much will they catch and how much, I guess, how much, how do they prove value is a big question. I, I hope like, at the very least, uh, governments are thinking about installing things like this. Um, yeah, all over. Agreed. And on to our lightning round. Uh, first article is Fatal Tesla Model S Crash in California Prompts Federal Pro. Uh, so the U.S. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration Um, or NHTSA, is investigating a fatal crash involving a 2022 Tesla Model S that may have had its automated driving system activated. And this accident was in Newport Beach, California, and three people unfortunately died in that accident earlier this month. And that brings the total possible deaths due to autopilots up to 15, I think it's it's actually quite a high number, uh, and there's a whole Wikipedia page for it. So um, unfortunate, and does seem like an investigation is needed. And the next article is Facebook issues three hundred ninety seven dollar checks to Illinois residents as part of class action. So more than a million actually Illinois residents are going to receive this settlement payment from Facebook uh, this week. And this is thanks to the legal battle over over Facebook's uh, since retired now photo tagging system that used facial recognition, which is very much related to that Clearview AI. 
Yeah. yeah, we covered this earlier this year that they were discontinuing the service, which was kind of surprising. Uh, but given these kinds of things, maybe it makes sense. And on that note, our last story in the lightning round, Clearview AI's facial recognition tool coming to apps and schools. So Clearview AI is expanding sales of its facial recognition software to companies, not just uh, police forces. So companies, like it said, to um, you know stores, schools, things like that. This article doesn't have very many details. It's from Reuters, and they just noted kind of a general intent to do that. Uh, but, um, you know, I'm sure we'll start seeing Clearview AI or continue seeing Clearview AI in the news with this sort of expansion. And we'll continue seeing more lawsuits pop up. Uh, we've just discussed the ACLU case. I think last week or two weeks ago. Uh, so I guess we will never stop talking about Clearview AI on this podcast. That's yep. it seems <laughs> probably like probably actually just, never. <laughs> yeah. And on to our fun and neat stories. First up, a novelist and an AI co-wrote your next cringe read. So this article covers a new novelette titled Amor Cringe by the Los Angeles-based writer Alado McDowell. And so it apparently is setting out to be the cringiest story possible, uh, but it does seem like actually a pleasant book to read. It's all about sort of um, someone trying to discover God as an influencer, and as the title says, it was co-written with AI, specifically this offer use GPT-3 and basically kind of made parts of it with GPT-3, parts of it themselves, and then kind of spliced and edited it, combined it in various ways. So um, just kind of playing around with no real rules. And um, yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. I think maybe your first case of an actual novel that isn't just sort of AI-generated nonsense uh, being released. So pretty intriguing. I think a funny mention in the article is that, you know, cringe is really, quote, in the eye of the beholder. So it's, you know, it's, it's very subjective. But the author, you know, does say that AI is a mirror for humanity. And so in a way, this mirror um, reveals what it reveals about us might make us sad, might make us cringe. So, uh, yeah, personally, I subscribe to a belief that you cannot intentionally create cringe. Cringe is never uh, something you can, um, you know, set out to make. It's all about trying to be uh legitimate or authentic and then somehow failing so i don't i don't necessarily buy this um concept but i do like the blurb from the book uh page you can just buy this book like a normal book so a more cringe explores the du dually based and beautiful aspects of self-obsessed media culture in a perennial bohemian style, an unnamed, ungendered protagonist travels from coast to coast and affair to affair, stumbling upon various moments of failure, absurd insight, and flashes of transcendence. So it seems like a great concept for an AI to help uh, write, since AI really cannot deal with sort of long-term coherent storytelling. It makes a lot of sense. Not yet, at least... <laughs> um, and on to our last article, uh, AI made this thumbnail and it actually is not an article. It's actually a YouTube video. Uh, it's about Dolly, uh, explaining Dolly to a layperson. Uh, I really encourage uh, watching this if you, uh, or sharing this, um, if you want to share it, you know, and, and explain like in five type of way, it's by an influencer. Um, and the thumbnail was actually generated by Dolly, you know, given, uh, a description of, I think, a robot hand drawing a 
a human hand or drawing and maybe a drawing a robot hand too. Um, and using, you know, one of using Dolly two to actually, um, uh, uh, create that thumbnail was a pretty, pretty clickbaity, but also pretty fun, uh, of a video. Yeah, this is by the channel uh, Marques Brownlee, who typically does tech reviews. So he talks a lot about phones. It's a pretty big YouTube channel with 15 million subscribers. And this video already has um, 1.4 million views. So um, yeah, it's neat that actually there's an explainer video that dives into some of the technical aspects of how this works and showcases DALL-E 2 which is, uh, I, I think is pretty mind blowing still. And I'm sure a lot of reviewers of this, um, are pretty mind blowing as well. Although the first comment comment here, uh, in the page says as impressive as it is scary. So I'm not sure, uh, how many people might get a bit too freaked out from just how impressive it is. And with that, thank you so much for listening to us at this week's episode of Skynet Today's Last Week in AI podcast. You can find the articles we discussed here today and subscribe to our weekly newsletter with similar ones at lastweekin.ai. And share this with your friends who like AI, if you do like this podcast. And if you do like this podcast, feel free to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and keep that five-star rating afloat. Uh, for the future and even if you don't feel like doing those things please just stay tuned to our future episodes <laughs>